So, what is performance-based financing? Um, I imagine many of you in the room already know the answer, so that's good. We can move fairly quickly through this slide. But really just to say, obviously there are a lot of terms within results-based financing um, school. Some of them are very varied. They include contracting, which we've just heard about in Afghanistan. Uh, sometimes they include uh, demand-side intervention. Some people even include social health insurance. So RBF as a term can be extremely broad, but we're talking about performance-based financing, which has coalesced around a fairly established model now, which is based on payment for outputs to providers, usually with a quality modification. And generally, there's some form of trickle-down payment to individual staff within that, within the facility. Um, and the idea behind it is it's based on a, on a division of functions, so you have a regulator of some sort, you have a purchasing agency, fund holding, and then service providers although it does vary quite considerably across contexts. So as we were saying, why are we looking at it in this session on fragile states? Because it's really proliferated very widely and rapidly in these contexts. And we within Rebuild started by looking at why that was. Um, the literature's got some interesting paradoxes in it. On the one hand, people would say, well, PBF is, is, is in terms of its architecture, is quite a complex financing instrument. So, obviously, it's not suited to settings where, as we saw earlier, the institutions are relatively weak. Um, on the other hand, there's an argument that in, in a relative, um, uh, not a vacuum, that would be overstating it, but in a place where these relationships are still quite loose, that there's a possibility of kind of bringing in these contractual arrangements with relatively little um, interest groups to oppose which in a way was the argument that um, we were just hearing from Afghanistan around how um, the, the basic package contracting out model had been able to spread very quickly. So you've got these two different findings and we started by doing um, a literature review based on the hypotheses about why um, and, and how this spread had occurred. So just to demonstrate, if you look at the, this is now a, a very old map, but you can see that over the last decade or so, there's been this very rapid expansion, starting from the kind of Great Lakes area, and now going to many, many countries in, in Africa and in other regions as well, but this one is obviously focused on Africa. So we looked, uh, we started with, as I say, with a set of hypotheses, we then looked at the literature to try and understand um, whether it was in fact more common to adopt performance-based financing in fragile settings. Um, and indeed, it does look like um, they're even more uh, common in, in, those, in those places. So out of the programs in, in Africa, for example, 56% of them are implemented in FCAS settings. And 43 out of the 53 countries which were classified within our literature search as FCAS had at least one PBF program. So we know that they are out there, they're very widespread. Um, and we also found something interesting about the sequence of adoption, and that was that the, the, fra the fragile countries were the early adopters as well. So the model was kind of tested and refined to some extent in um, FCAS countries. Um, and indeed the countries that then scaled up nationally have also um, mostly been FCAS countries. And in some ways, it looked as if this model was a successor to the performance-based contracting that had been developed in places like Haiti and indeed Afghanistan, as we were just hearing, that there was a kind of first wave of innovation that focused on a kind of contracting through NGO model, and that then the, the PBF seems to have come, been born out as a, a modification of that. And just to highlight that we're not just talking about one country, uh, one scheme per country, that many of these countries have multiple schemes, and that's also, of course, can be a challenge and sometimes they're sequential or overlapping but for example DRC has had seven and Burundi six over the last ten years so that's clearly something to manage so what are the control we promised you controversies what are the controversies about performance-based financing you can see I've only found 12 and um, probably in the room we could produce even more if we put our heads together um, but just to highlight them very simply and then our panel can hopefully pick up on some of these so one of the questions has been around this issue of drivers. Um, are these um, really responding to local needs and conditions, or are they in fact just a kind of donor-imposed, donor-financed external intervention? <coughs> Very strong views on both sides about that. A link to that, this question about adaption to context. So 
Do we find that performance-based financing is in fact flexible and adaptable to, to mould the different situation it finds, or is it just being kind of copied and pasted across settings? And again, interesting you know, evidence around that. As with many health and health financing interventions, of course, there's a whole gap between the plan and the reality. I don't think that's specific to PBF, but again, there's quite a lot of literature around what really happens and some of the modifications that have to be introduced. And then there's also a lot of debate around the health system impact. So is performance-based financing coming in and establishing um, another parallel um, financing mechanism that's adding to, to fragmentation? Or is it in fact a way of trying to coalesce around an agreed set of priorities and therefore something that is helping to, to bring in a system strengthening element? We'll also find in the literature the issue of equity. So performance-based financing does tend to bring in certain modifications that are equity augmenting, for example, having additional payments to um, some hardship areas. Um, so some people argue it's an equitable strategy and it's focused on primary health care often, so that's you know, a good thing. But on the other hand, it's also something that tends to reward high performers. And so there's an argument about geographical equity as well. So there's, there's, there's again, not, these are not two truths that are, that are alternate, as it were. Sometimes they can both be true, um, depending on how you look at it. On the question of efficiency, again, two very different perspectives um, have been taken. On the one hand, you can say that performance-based financing is leveraging the system to make it work, that you add in a small incremental amount to make all of those underlying investments that are there really work for these priority services. So that's the positive argument. And the negative argument is that it's really a very costly distraction, that you're increasing all the architecture and you're a lot of transaction costs, as, I, as we were discussing earlier on the Afghan case. Um, and that really, ultimately, it's, you know, it's an unsustainable uh, separate program. In relation to quality of care, um, within the design of PBF, there is a focus on quality of care, so there's an argument around improving quality of care, and that, that quality of care, actually a lot of the designs are increasingly trying to orient themselves towards supporting that. However, on the other side of the coin, um, the bulk of funding in many PBF schemes is actually just paying for volume. And sometimes it's paying for volume on services which are already really uptaken and delivered, and so it's actually not very effective, and, it, and it's it's kind of output oriented, it's output what we really want in the health system. So that's the kind of debate around the quality side. And, and then linked to that is this question around effectiveness. Um, so are we really just funding outputs or are we actually getting um, health outcomes? And that's a debate that's not just happening in low and middle income countries, it's also very much a debate that's happening in, in high income countries, um, including in the UK. And again, and again we have a session on PBF design tomorrow morning, where we'll be discussing that a bit more across these different regions, if people want to get even more into the detail. The next set of questions is around mechanisms of change. So even if we know what it's doing and we've got some measure of, of change and, and, and kind of outcomes or outputs of the system, we, there's a lot of debate about what is actually driving that. Is it because these schemes are just bringing some additional resources to some quite under-resourced places? Is it because it's actually clarifying the roles of the players? Is it because it's increasing local autonomy, or building skills, or bringing in better feedback loops on people's performance? Or is it, in fact, all of the above? So, in each setting we have a lot of debate, and there's quite a lot of literature now around theory of change, but also, how do we look at it? Do we look at it as, a, as a, is it really about finance? The trouble is the name suggests it's about finance, but actually most people think it's about that whole bigger package. And can we pick out the different elements of the package? What do we need to? Then we come to spillover effects. Is this something that is acting as a catalyst for wider reforms, so having positive spillover effects? Or is it just causing providers to gain the system? You know, change their recording? Is it, is it, it, is it, is it um, demoralising staff because they're seeing themselves losing professionalism and you know, just being um, treated as, as, as kind of financial agents and so on? So again, very active debate in the literature around all of these. And also at the heart of the model, there are some tensions, and this, I think, based on our observation in some of the case studies we've been involved in as we build, is that PBF talks the language of empowerment and autonomy, but actually the way it's structured is very micro-controlling often with 
many, um, yeah, not just contracts, but verification with, with, with sanctions for minor misdemeanors, for specifications, for very detailed rules about the quality, for example, of go down to, you know, have you got your waste paper basket in the corner kind of stuff. So, so, the, so the reality of the, the way it's set up and the way it operates also interestingly raise some tensions of that kind. And finally, a lot of these schemes are, of course, still externally financed, but it's not just about money, it's also about capacity. So we're going to hear from Jos again on our panel who, who um, you know, Cordaid is a major implementer, but these NGOs also have huge capacity and knowledge of how to do things. And so we are, in many countries, are we able to get beyond that dependency on the technical capacity as well as the external finance which PBF has brought? So is that enough controversies for you? 